All right, welcome to Lecture 25B, entitled Modeling Using DRAC Distribution Functions. Uh, the material for this lecture comes from Reading Assignment 5, Section 2.1. So the objectives are to figure out how we can apply the DRAC delta distributions to model a scalar density row for point, line, and sheet sources, how to apply Dirac delta distributions to model a flux density J for line and sheet sources, and how to calculate the integral of a scalar density and flux density when Dirac delta distributions are invoked. So basic concepts and visualization skills in this teaching module that, that you basically will acquire are including how to model a point, line, and sheet source for irrotational field problems, how to model a line and sheet source for source-free problems, field-free problems, and thirdly, the technique for computing integrals involving Dirac delta distributions. As usual, the second slide is just a summary of the slides to follow, so we'll just move on. All right, so question of modeling point, line, or surface sources. First of all, consider a scalar function or vector-valued function which is infinite or undefined at specific points and zero elsewhere. Secondly, you would need to invoke distribution functions or Dirac delta functions to model the behavior of said function at the specific points in question. And thirdly, we're going to say that the distributions that we're considering are said to have even symmetry as to make the calculations easier. So here's an example of a uh, Dirac delta distribution. In this case, we call it a Gaussian distribution. There are an infinite number of possibilities and combinations available out there. Uh, you choose the one that serves your purpose, usually for sake of making calculations easy. Uh, if you want to see basically an interactive simulation for this uh, distribution, you can click on the link that you see over here. So the Gaussian distribution, again, delta of x, would have this form. It will involve a limit of this value a going to 0, 1 over a square root of pi, e to the minus x over a squared. And what we do is we let a go to 0. Now, if a goes to 0, this term goes to infinity. And the width of this, this sort of uh, shape here gets smaller and smaller. So with small, a getting smaller, this peak gets larger and the width gets smaller. So effectively what you'll end up with a value of zero, except at x equals zero, that you'll end up this spike that goes to infinity. Uh, it's even because if you look at the area under the curve to the right of the uh, y-axis, it's the same as the area under the curve to the left of the y-axis. And the units of the delta function would be a, one over meter. So they still have units, just one over meter. And so this is a limiting exercise which we use to define delta x. All right, so some properties of the uh, direct delta functions. And because it's a limiting process, so three particular examples. If we take a delta function with argument x minus x prime dx, integrate between upper limit and lower limit of infinity and minus infinity respectively, you always get a value equal to 1. This is a property of Dirac delta function. So it basically has is infinitely large and zero width at a specific location in space, zero elsewhere. So at x equals x prime is where the Dirac delta function basically becomes undefined. All right, another, another thing to look at is the notion of even symmetry. If we integrate from minus infinity to x prime and from x prime to infinity, then these two basically will have by, be identical. This basically captures half of the area under the Dirac delta distribution, and this takes up half the area. We know that the total integral from minus infinity is, to infinity is 1, and therefore by just going from minus infinity to x prime, we end up with a value of 1 half. All right. Thirdly, if we were to take some arbitrary function and multiply by Dirac delta function argument with x minus x prime and integrate from minus infinity to infinity, this thing we call a sampler. What it does is it picks off the value of the function at x equals x prime. So we end up with fx prime. Again, if we look at the definition of delta x minus x prime, it will be 0 for x not equal to x prime and undefined for x equals x prime. Okay, a note here, 
The limits of integration are shown from minus infinity to infinity, but in actual practice, the integration result remains unchanged if you use values that are fine up, but at least bracket the peak. So for instance, here's an example. You got minus infinity to infinity of delta x minus x prime dx. We know that's equal to one, but we could have easily have written this as x prime minus delta x and x prime plus delta x. So this basically says you're looking at one bound that's just to the right of the of the undefined uh, uh, function and one to the left. And this is more than, this basically brackets the, uh, the Dirac delta function. As a result, this integral will also be equal to one. So this is typically what we would do. All right, so then let's look at distribution functions of filaments and cylindrical coordinates and point sources and spherical and polar coordinates. In this case, we're dealing with transformation of coordinates, so we're dealing with a radius, but radius is only defined for r greater than or equal to zero. And therefore, when we do an integration of a Dirac delta function in either one of these coordinate systems, we're only considering, we're only basically capturing half the distribution. All right, so the upper integration bound on R for cylindrical point sources in 2D or 3D or filamentary sources in 3D or spherical point sources in 3D can be some value slightly larger than zero in order to capture the Dirac delta function. So for example, uh, since again, R is just is greater than or equal to zero, if we integrate from zero to some value R just greater than zero of delta R prime dr prime, this value will be equal to one half. All right, so let's consider now some applications, and we'll start with the Dirac distribution for filamentary charge density. So in this figure here on the left, basically, is a two-dimensional Dirac delta function. But in this case, basically, we are expressing, expressing in cylindrical coordinates. So in effect, what you have is delta r, where r is greater than or equal to zero. And you can see here that it spikes at zero, which is equivalent to saying you have a, a point charge in 2D uh, sitting at the at the origin, that is uh, position x equals zero, y equals zero. Up here, for instance, if you were to select the value of a, or just let this go back and forth, what you'll see is that this particular spike gets larger as this width gets narrower and narrower. So this is basically just taken as a trace of the object so that you can see the actual general profile of the um, of the Dirac delta function. Uh, so in this case, you'll notice it's an even function because the area under the yellow section, the area under the blue section is on, are exactly the same, which means basically they take on a value of half of the total. Anyways, so this is a, just a description of a point source in 2D. We can now extend this also, for instance, to a surface charge, in which case, which case we'd be looking at something like this. And so in this case, what you see is a ring, this is basically just being sliced through so that you can see it from both ends. So you have a ring and the radius of this ring would be some value r, and that's basically the b value that you see here. And by adjusting this, you can actually watch this radius increase. And the a value is basically determining the width of this section here in blue or yellow. And as a gets uh, smaller and smaller, the width gets smaller and smaller, and the value of peak value here increases. And so effectively what's happening is you get a value of zero, except at a point where R equals capital R, which corresponds to the radius of the ring. And at that point, the function of course blows up. Area still is equal to, is equal to uh, under this curve that you see here. Anyway, so you can play with this distribution if you want, A in terms of basically the width here, and of course the height will change as well. And B basically will just increase the radius of this ring. All right, so let's look at some examples in terms of how would you basically write out the charge density for a number of examples. If we have a volume distribution, then we use the symbol rho, and units is coulombs per cubic meter. The surface distribution, we're going to use the symbol sigma. That's a coulombs per meter squared units. Line distribution, we're going to use symbol lambda. Units are coulombs per meter in either 2D or 3D. And a point charge will have the symbol Q and has units of coulombs in 2D or 3D. So if we look at this example, this is an infinitely long uh, filament, and you've got a point charge here. If we were to represent this system in terms of Dirac delta functions, then rho would involve this quantity here, del lambda, delta x, delta y, which corresponds to this filament. And this is a point charge, so this would be q. Uh, it's a um, th three-dimensional point, so 
there'll be three, three delta functions in this case. Delta x, because it's at x equals 0. Delta of y minus 2, y because it's displaced by two units along the y-axis. And basically, it's at delta z. So this represents the, uh, the charge density of the point source. And this term represents the charge density of this filament. Now let's take an example of a surface charge. So this cylinder would extend to infinity in both directions. So in this case, rho would be equal to sigma delta r minus 1, because it's a surface charge density. And this would be in uh, cylindrical coordinates. If we're dealing with a volumetric charge density, and again, this would go to infinity, let's say it's a uniform charge density, rho naught, within the radius 0 less than equal to r is less than equal to 1, and 0 out, outside of that region, then we would basically describe the charge density in this fashion here. Now, we've cho chosen the, um, an example involving charge, but you could have also had mass, in which case C is replaced by the units of mass in kilograms. All right, so here just a pictorial description of the, uh, various scalar density, direct displacement distributions for rho. So this is a point source. And so I could write this basically in Cartesian coordinates. It's just delta x, delta y, delta z. Units would be coulombs per cubic meter. I could also write it in spherical coordinates, in which case it would be written in this form, where this r now is just the radius. All right, infinite line, I could write it in Cartesian coordinates as lambda delta x delta y, or in cylinder coordinates as lambda delta r over pi r, r of course being the radius uh, parallel to the xy plane. If I'm dealing with a surface, a uh, planar surface, so this would be sigma, which is a surface charge density. This lies right on, this, on the xy plane, which means this is basically delta of z. This is an um, a, a infinite cylinder, uh, and in this case, basically, it's got a surface charge on it. And so in this case, rho would be sigma times delta r minus r, where r is the, the radius of the cylinder. And again, the units of rho remain always as coulombs per cubic meter. And here's a sphere with a surface charge. In this case, basically, it would be similar to this one, but now this r represents a radius that points in all directions in space. Here, the radius is only pointing parallel to the xy plane. All right, so the next thing is the scalar property derived from taking the triple integral of rho dv, which is nothing more than the total charge enclosed. I could have also used mass density rather than uh, charge density. And so the units of the integrated scalar volume density rho do not depend on whether the function representing rho is differentiable, not differentiable, or a Dirac delta distribution. So let's look at a couple of examples. So Q, which would be the total charge enclosed, would be rho dv. A differentiable case, a non-differentiable case, would be where we have to break it up into separate regions. So in this region is differentiable, this region is differentiable, and this region is differentiable. Total charge enclosed would be just the sum of the three contributions if we're talking about three different regions. Let's now look at a 3D example. Uh, point charge, surface charge, and line charge. Different ways of representing the total charge enclosed. So if this was a point charge, we can either represent the point charge in, in Cartesian coordinates or in spherical coordinates. So in Cartesian coordinates, it would be delta x, delta y, delta z, if the point charge is at the origin. Uh, similarly, if we want to expand, uh, so write this in spherical coordinates, then this would be the operative term representing rho in spherical coordinates. And we would integrate from 0 to r, where r just is greater than 0. And this would be total charge enclosed. So this or this will give you the same answer. It may be more convenient to use this formulation. What about a surface? If you have a surface, then the total charge on the surface would be surface charge density, delta z, dz, dy, dx, if we're dealing with a planar. Uh, this would be example if we're dealing with a s uh, charge on the surface of a cylinder. And this would be the charge if we're de uh, dealing with the charge on the surface of a sphere. So this is a tar total charge enclosed. And again, r basically just needs to be slightly larger than zero in order basically um, uh, in order to, uh, it's, it's just slightly larger than capital R, which is the radius of the cylinder, in order to basically incorporate uh, the full cylinder. Similarly here, this R needs to be just larger than capital R to incorporate the full extent of the, uh, of the sphere. And finally, we have the line. If we have an infinitely long line or filament, in Cartesian coordinates, the total charge on the filament 
would be just the integral of delta x delta y because the filament pierces the xy plane, whereas in along the direction z, basically, it can take on different values. Uh, we could also write this expression in cylindrical coordinates, in which case uh, the rho would take on this form. And again, uh, because r basically uh, can only take on values uh, greater than or equal to zero, uh, all you need to do is have r slightly zero, then slightly larger than zero, in which case you basically can capture the, the filament as a whole. So just again, a, a note, Q in this example represents the total in char char charge enclosed by a Gaussian surface in units of coulombs. A Gaussian surface in this case basically would be just, a, is that the volume that we're dealing with, basically that volume basically will have bounding surfaces. And so through the divergence theorem, we can link essentially the enclosed surface uh, to the total charge enclosed. All right, so now let's look at the flux density J and look at the different types of distributions that we could have. So we could have, for instance, a, a zero D type of problem, which is a current filament. And if you were to take a trace, that would be basically equivalent to looking at a 2D point source. You could also have current flowing ascent along a contour, in which case it would be a 1D type of problem. Or you could have current flowing through an actual surface, in which case it would be a, a, 2D surf, a 2D type of problem. In this case, if the current is flowing through a filament, then the current is uh, I, and its units is amps. If the current's flowing through a contour, then the current density at any given point along the contour would have units of amperes per meter, and it's given the symbol J subscript S. On the other hand, if the current basically is flowing through the surface as a whole, then the symbol that's used is something other than JS or I. Uh, so it might be as a function of a function of a distance. Uh, it could be constant, in which case we'll be given some label. But it would not be a value either I or JS to make it distinct from the case of a filament source as well as a um, source basically on a contour. Uh, in the case of uh, a uh, 2D, uh, through a surface, the units are amps per meter squared, or also can be written as coulombs per second per meter squared. So if we look at each one of these three cases, and for the first case, which is a filament which is extends infinite distance in the positive and the negative z direction, if we were to try to understand how to characterize this current flux density, uh, then in cylindrical coordinates, it would take on the following form. It would be bi times delta r over r, pi over r, and the current basically is flowing in the z direction. Now, if this were basically in Cartesian coordinates, then this would be, instead of a delta r, it would be a delta x, delta y, if we're looking at a trace in the xy plane. On the other hand, if you have a current that flows through the uh, sort of cylinder uh, on the exterior surface, where the cylinder's radius is capital R, then in cylindrical coordinates, we can characterize this current flux density as having a z hat, being in the z hat direction, and it's a delta function, and to be r minus r. So clearly, when r is equal to r, it's basically when there's a current, and then either on the inside or on the outside, there is no current flux density. So this would be a representation for this particular problem uh, in, um, in cylindrical coordinates. And again, this current uh, uh, shell basically extends to infinity in both directions. The last case would be if you have a surface through the, which a current flux density flows. And this, of course, extends to infinity in both the positive and the next negative direction. Here it's clear that the current flux density is in the z-hat direction. It's uniform within the range of 0 to r to 1. Uh, and therefore, you can state that j is equal to j naught z-hat, j naught being a constant. And exterior to r equals 1. There is no current flux density, so this takes on the value of zero z hat. You can look each each one of these individual diagrams at the following link. Now we've chosen an example here, which is involving charge uh, in terms of uh, current flux density, but could also have chosen max flux density, in which case coulombs would be have been replaced by kilograms. All right, so let's look at a couple of examples here. So, for instance, if we were looking at current flux density that's in a plane that's residing on the xy plane, uh, then this is current flux density in the x hat direction, and it's a surface charge density, so this would be delta s, and j of subscript s, delta z.
if we're looking at a line flux density, this is in the z hat direction, we could either express this in terms of uh, Cartesian coordinates, in which case this is delta x, delta y, or in cylindrical coordinates, it would take on a form that looks like this. All right, here we have a current flux density residing on the surface. So in this case, basically, we would have delta r minus r. It's in the z hat direction. And again, j of s represents the surface current flux density, which has units of amps per meter. This is a case where the current flux density is in a circumferential direction. All right, so if we're dealing again uh, with a cylindrical coordinate system, this direction would be representative of the theta hat direction. But again, uh, it's on a surface, and that surface exists at r equals capital R. So this still is delta r minus r, and this is a surface current flux density, J subscript S. All right, so then next thing is the scalar flux property derived from this expression, J dot ds. Right, and units of J would be amps per meter squared. If this were a mass flux density, this would be units of kilograms per second per meter squared. Amps can also be written as coulombs per second. So just some general guidance. And given a vector valued function J and a differential area element ds, the current flux I is defined by taking the integral of J dot ds over the surface of interest. And that generally would be essentially the surface is defined by the enclosed contour through Stokes' theorem. J dot ds is a scalar value function and represents the differential flux. The orientation of ds, the vector, with respect to J in Stokes' theorem problems is a degree of freedom. So you, ha you have some choice here in terms of how you select the direction. Typically, you want to choose J to be parallel to ds, okay? Again, because you want to make this integral simple to solve. The cosine depends the angle between the two vectors is removed. And so you get the cosine and the angles either one or minus one. So this integral either has a positive value or a negative value. All right, so let's look at some examples. Uh, the units of the integrated flux density do not depend on whether the function representing J is differentiable, not differentiable, or a Dirac delta distribution. So for example, if it's differentiable, you would just basically integrate over S. On the other hand, if there are two separate regions, and each region is differentiable, then the total current enclosed would be the contribution for region 1 for the current and a contribution for region 2 for the current. If we're dealing with a Dirac distribution for a 3D object, then we have two options. We have, for instance, a surface. We could have a surface current. We can also have a, a filament current or a line current. If we're dealing with a planar type of object, right, then effectively, and it's in the happens to be in the x hat direction, the current flux density, then this is this integration that would have to be performed. And you'll notice here we have z just slightly greater than zero and z just slightly less than zero. Why is that? Because that way we can capture the delta function. Um, in this case, uh, we have a current flowing along a cylinder in the axial direction along a surface. So here you have r prime minus r, the r, capital R being the radius of the cylinder. This is the Dirac delta function associated with it. This is the current flux, surface current flux density in terms of units of amps per meter. And of course, this is in cylindrical coordinates. And this gives you the total current enclosed. Circumferentially, the only difference between this one and this one is in that, in this case, the current was flowing in the z hat direction. Here, the current basically is flowing in the theta hat direction. All right, so that's basically the, the, the only major difference that we're dealing with here. Uh, and also, if you look at the area vector, uh, in this case, basically, it's a r prime dr prime d theta, whereas in this case, basically, it's dr prime uh, uh, dz and, d, and theta hat. So uh, the area through which the calculation is taking place is different than the case for axial. Again, because we want the current flux density and the area vector to be pointing in the same direction when we're doing these sorts of calculations. All right, for line, the total current enclosed, if it's Cartesian, this would be I times delta Y delta X, assuming the current filament is along the Z axis, it's in the Z hat direction. And so this is basically the area vector points in the same direction, which is Z hat. Uh, alternatively, we could have written this in cylindrical coordinates. In cylindrical coordinates, uh, the area that we're differential area would be dealing with be with R prime D, R prime D theta. Current still flows in the z hat direction, but of course the 
the description of the direct delta function has a different form because this is in cylindrical coordinates. Notice again that all we need is for r to be slightly larger than zero and you basically capture basically everything you need to regarding the direct delta function. So again, I in this example represents the total current flux enclosed by the contour in units of amps. And we use a closed contour because all these problems basically are going to be derived from an application of Stokes theorem. All right, that concludes Lecture 25B. Thank you for listening.